Last time we talked about must be true questions, in part because they're one of the most common question types in logical reasoning. Tonight we're talking about flaw questions because it is either the most common or second most common behind must be true. Like those two question types compete for most frequency on the test, right? And um, must be true questions lend themselves to flaw questions. Most people would think of them as worlds apart, but they're actually very similar. So, what happens in a flaw question? You're always, always given an argument. So if you read the passage and you say, oh, that's a nice set of facts. And then it says, which one of the following best describes the error in reasoning? You have to stop and say, wait a sec. It wasn't just a set of facts. Reasoning means argument. So there was an argument, and you have to figure out what the conclusion was and what the evidence was. Right? All arguments have at least one premise and at least one conclusion. So for the sake of our discussion, let's assume that we have three premises and a conclusion. In the flaw questions, what they're telling you, an argument that is flawed is an argument in which the premises are not sufficient to prove the conclusion. I'm not using big words just to use big words, but the LSAT really likes that word, sufficient, right? Um, and if you can get your mind wrapped around it, it's very helpful. But the point is, is that if the evidence is not sufficient, that means that there are missing pieces. And what are missing pieces? Assumptions. Assumptions. That's it. So there are premises that were left out. How do they write these arguments? I have one theory <coughs> that they actually include several premises. They make a le legit argument, and then they come in and they go, aha, let me erase these premises, and now the argument seems legit because the premises that they erase tend to be the kinds of things that almost everyone agrees on. Right? Like, if I said to you, um, going to law school will make you very unhappy for the rest of your life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just hypothetical. <laughs> based on personal experience. So, um, <laughs> if you go to law school, then you will be ha unhappy for the rest of your life, right? Okay, law school, then you will be unhappy for the rest of your life. Therefore, <coughs> therefore, conclusion, you should not go to law school. What is this argument assuming? That you don't want to be unhappy for the rest of your life. That you don't want to be unhappy for the rest of your life, right? They said, look, being unhappy for the rest of your life is bad, or something that you shouldn't do. And if you go to law school, then you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life. Then yes, you shouldn't go to law school because that would lead to being unhappy for the rest of your life, which apparently is something that is bad or something that you shouldn't do. Right? OK. Um, <clears throat> but they don't say that. They get rid of this because they expect most test takers to read oh, you will be unhappy for the rest of your life, and you're just like, oh, that sucks. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. But this is an invalid, uh, this is an invalid argument. It's flawed. Okay? Um, I'm having trouble writing here. But in any case, this is invalid. It's flawed. That means the same thing. The bottom line is an argument is, is simply something, an argument where the evidence is not sufficient. It's not enough to prove the conclusion. It may support it. But if it doesn't prove it, then it's not valid. So what happens here is you read the argument. The conclusion is not always last. For when we visually represent these arguments, I tend to put the conclusion last. But the conclusion can be presented <coughs> anywhere. That said, you identify what the conclusion is, and you identify what the evidence is, and you figure out if the evidence proves the conclusion, and it won't. And you just try to figure out what pieces are missing. What else do I need to get to this conclusion? Now, when you guys were doing must be true questions, they weren't giving you a conclusion, right? They were just like, fact, 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 whatever, right? And then they said, if the statements above are true, which one of the following answers must be true? 
So what was your job in that situation? Yes. To infer. To infer. And an inference is the same as a conclusion. So if you infer something, you're you can, it's something that you can conclude from whatever you were told. In other words, you were tasked with finding a valid conclusion. Right? That was your job. You had to figure out something else that must be true <coughs> given what was said. So when you look at an argument and, and you're trying to decide whether it's valid or invalid, look at the premises, figure out what you could conclude from it, and see if that's the same or different from the conclusion that they actually drew. And if it's a flaw question, I guarantee you it will be different, or your reasoning is flawed. Right? If you come to the same conclusion, you're like, oh yeah, that's a legit conclusion. And then the question's like, how is this argument flawed? You've missed something. That's okay. Then you just have to go back and figure out what you missed. Why, why can't you get all the way here? Now, conclusions tend to be wrong or bad for two reasons. One, actually, instead of telling you, you guys remember what made the wrong answers wrong in must be true questions? Goes too far. Goes too far. How, is, how do things go too far? Strong language. Strong language. This is what we were just talking about in reading comp, right? Why aren't wrong answers wrong in reading comp? Because they went too far. They're not things you can properly infer or conclude from the evidence provided in the passage. So if you go too far, right, like they give you evidence about some and then they conclude about most, or they give you evidence about most and they <coughs> conclude about all, that's going too far. So either the answer choices go too far or... Do you remember what made wrong answers wrong in these must be true questions that you did last week? Yes? Um, if they introduce a new idea. That's exactly right. So if it introduces a new idea, you can't draw conclusions about things you've never talked about before. The conclusion has to be within the umbrella of whatever was discussed. If you think about this in terms of like trial, right? This is all about going to law school and becoming an attorney. If, you're try if you have evidence that proves that <coughs> Joe stole a Slurpee from 7-Eleven, you can't walk into court and say, and therefore I want to show that Sarah stole a Slurpee. They'd be like, you don't have any evidence about Sarah. That's outside the umbrella, the scope of what you're talking about. right? So the premises, you have to accept them as true, no matter how crazy they are. But you say, okay, even if they are true, do do them do all these premises together prove this or not? And they won't in flaw questions. And you just have to figure out why. Right? And that's either because the conclusion went too far or introduced new ideas. Right? So if you're not sure why an argument's flawed, just read every word in the conclusion to say, is any word in this conclusion too strong? Or is any word in this conclusion just totally new, came out of nowhere? If it did, that's a problem. Arguments can have more than one flaw. So the better and better you get at this, the better you're going to see or the more flaws you're going to see as you're reading the argument. You're like, whoa, whoa, you just jumped here. Oh, you jumped there. Stop. Okay. That's all I have to say about five. Oh, no, I should say one more thing. Um, <clears throat> as you go through the five answer choices, you have five answer choices, and in flaw questions, the five answer choices are descriptions. They're describing what the argument is doing wrong. And earlier tonight, we talked about organization questions in reading comp. You remember the organization question was like, the passage presents a thesis. The thesis is then frowned upon. Everybody cries. And you're like, okay, did that happen, right? That's exactly what you're doing in flaw questions. You're given five descriptions of what happened in the argument. The author confuses an important term with an unimportant term. You have to be like, wait, did that happen? So question number one, as you're reading these answer choices, is simply, did this happen? Because if it didn't happen, it doesn't matter if it's a flaw. A lot of the wrong answers describe totally legit flaws but they're not the flaw that occurred here. 
right? So it's wrong. <coughs> the second question you want to ask yourself is, is this a problem? Because some answer choices will be describing what happened, but they are not a problem. The example I always give is an example from a test that I took officially in which the answer choice, one of the answer choices said, the argument is vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that it draws a conclusion on the basis of evidence. I was like, okay, hold up. <laughs> did it draw a conclusion on the basis of evidence? Yes, it did. That happened. Is that a problem? No. That's how all arguments work. Right? So that answer choice is wrong because you need to be able to say yes to both of these questions. You need to be able to say yes, this is describing what happened in this flaw or in this argument, and yes, that's a problem. Now, we're talking about this in the abstract. The best thing here is just to jump in and do examples. So that's what we're going to do now. And then we can start seeing how the arguments are flawed and <coughs> how the answer choices can be eliminated by simply asking yourself these two questions. Okay? Um, 